Welcome everybody to our session today. This is a continuing education file and we'd like to uh, make sure that everybody's aware of that certification. I do also want to bring everybody's attention that we'd like to run a polling system with our questions and uh, you would then be able to go to your control screen in Teams and go to the polling function and be able to follow along and participate in our polling questions. Uh, it helps engage the audience to the topic and it helps us understand uh, you know, what we can improve on in our systems and what we can help you with. So I'd like to uh, introduce myself, I'm Mark Hendricks with Dane and my colleague Lisa Tutron in the background helping make sure that everything runs smoothly. Uh, thanks for your participation. Our objectives for this session is to focus on data center lightning damage risk reduction. Uh, we like to use a holistic approach. We say, you know, all encompassing approach to evaluate lightning standards uh, and apply external lightning protection, grounding, earthing, bonding. These are the you know, Ben Franklin figured this out, 1752, so still works today, along with newer concepts like surge protection devices that Dane actually helped pioneer into this market space to introduce the, the entire electrical protection system as well. And what that looks like, and this is a sketch out of the IEC methods, it's, think of it like layers. You have the outside world, the zone of protection, an LPZ that is unprotected, lightning could randomly strike. With the application of air terminals, lightning is likely to attach to the terminal based on the electric field strength influence, all the other factors. The air termination system takes it uh, down conductor system to the earth, and that connects to the earthing, the buried earthing system around the facility and all of the electrical power and data signal power pipes conduits things that come in and out of this structure are then also bonded and protected with that grounding system and as you move deeper into the structure maybe a hospital may be a good example as well certainly a data center has layers of protection getting closer to the 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 core uh mission critical function like your server rooms and so deep deeper within you have more grounding and shielding and more red and yellow electrical surge protection devices and so what that builds is a, a level of, of higher protection as you move through the structure so that's the principles and it starts with a risk analysis the risk analysis tells us What's the likelihood of damage or loss of life or loss of critical function? Data center not highly populated, but very critical function for loss of, of service. So the risk analysis basically takes in, think of it like a interview process. You evaluate the structure, you evaluate its surroundings, the, the materials, and you develop a model that you can prorate and derate for risk within allowable thresholds and the international standards and the USA standards and FPA 780 standards also have this similar types of thresholds and what that risk evaluates is if you do nothing you will have a high risk condition if you apply measures you will reduce your risk so these are the types of studies that that you might see in the industry and it, the same principles apply for data center, where if you don't do anything and you just have a building with some level of protection, you will have a high risk. Apply measures, you will reduce the risk. <clears throat> the basic standards that uh, that are followed in the industry, NFPA 780 uh, here in the United States, uh, the IEC 62305, uh, very, I want to say harmonized with some uh, differences between the international and the and the USA domestic standards. Just as an introduction, these are the NFPA 780, the UL covered with 1449 products uh, for SPDs and 
UL96 products for LPS materials. These are the things to put on your structure, uh, following guidelines for NFPA7 uh, installation of grounding applications and with suggestions from my IEEE committees. It's aligned, but it's somewhat fragmented. They don't directly uh, lead intuitively to each other and what what standard do you have to follow as a bare minimum and what do you need to do to to enhance it it's not as obvious <laughs> the focus is on bonding and creating an equipotential bonded structure and i like to use the bird on a wire everybody rises everybody lowers no matter what happens with lightning it's it's bonded together like a flat plane the iec standards focus on uh, 62305 with 62561 materials, surge protection devices fall under the 61643 family. The EN standards are and IEC standards are fairly well coordinated under the, the 6000 electromagnetic uh, interference family of standards. It offers some advantages because it also defines isolation techniques, and this we'll talk about a little bit more with data center applications. Some of the main differences is in a design philosophy calculation methods, but I think what's a core difference is that the IEC standards try to help define the intensity and the, the actual science of the lightning strike to further the effectiveness of the calculations. And so we'll see a little bit of that, but the other types of, you know, uh, approach to lightning protection are all very well harmonized. The air terminal, down conductor, earthing systems, very similar in their structures. Uh, but that lightning intensity shows up in a couple of different ways. I like this particular photograph from, uh, I first saw it from National Geographic, but it's it's a lightning striking a sycamore tree, and it's a clear explanation of not to stand under trees during a lightning storm. Uh, and uh, the general rule of thumb is, of course, to stay at least 10 feet away from the base of any type of tree or, or structure like that. But there's a lot going on because you also see step leader attachment, uh, the nature of that, uh, what we like to call the rolling sphere. This is this is where a lot of lightning protection evaluation comes from. This is essentially what Ben Franklin figured out. If you put up the rod, it gets a little bit closer to the electric field center. And so that charge momentarily is stationary, looking for its next attachment and step leader as it jaggedly goes through the atmosphere. And that final step leader is influenced by the intensity of the lightning and, uh, of course, the, the dielectric breakdown of the air. Very to define it as a sphere and we have a probability of that sphere radius, and then we can literally roll that around a structure and use that rolling sphere method to uh, identify what needs to have air terminals applied. There are other methods in the NFPA 780 calculations. You can use what's called the air terminal placement method, which relies on uh, very good experience that lightning strikes the edges of structures it prefers that that higher discontinuity type of behavior perhaps but we see that uh, if you use the air termination placement air terminal placement method you often don't get quite the same solution as you would if you rolled the sphere over that structure so there's some just you know pros and cons about that there's also what's called protection angle method you see this very commonly in things like electrical switch yards where you have high mass over the transformer yard. This is a, a common technique. You see other techniques like this from even from uh, NASA and military standards where the protected zone is below that uh, definitive mast and, the, and a falling angle. The IEC methods give us a couple of options in how we roll that sphere over. It gives us some really, really strong calculation methods for higher risk and it lets us for instance use a standard i'll call it a, a sphere of 50 uh, sorry 45 meters but you have uh, the nfpa 
150 foot radius, which is the corresponding, you know, they're like I mentioned, they're very well harmonized. NFPA also recognizes the smaller sphere for the smaller sphere for uh, higher risk explosive areas, things like gases or storage of oxygen and things, uh, perhaps uh, fuel depots at a data center where you may need to run on generator backup. So you'll have higher risk areas on even a data center for applications. And where that derives from is the the lower right of this slide has the the range of risk identified by IEC. And what that means is that if you have a high risk, we account for more of the behavior of lightning, more of the high strikes, but also more of the low strikes, the less than 3 kA down in that lower right hand side of the slide. That's the highest risk and you're accounting for a, I'll say a less severe strike range. And what that what that falls away as is something like this slide above where you have a lot of low intensity strikes, maybe below 12,000 amps. That's what's on this lower X axis is 12,000 amps. And there's a lot of strikes that occur in that range. And then there are some very high wrath of God peak strikes, and that's a similar correspondence to the to the IEC definition of strike levels. And that Ka level gives us the rolling sphere diameter. It's a relationship between the sm the smaller strike level provokes a smaller electric field, uh, a less intensity before it'll get into the nooks and crannies of a structure, a, a very high intensity lightning strike like 10 ka provokes a larger electric field it'll provoke a lightning attachment point sooner with shorter distances so that behavior is, is pretty well identified under the iec industry standards but that also gives us a very strong alignment to the mill standards and they're very high uh, critical mission critical type applications where you really want to have the best understanding of lightning, which is the definitions for mill standards, which give you high impulse ratings, which are very similar to the ratings you get from the IEC impulse testing. This 10 by 350 impulse is actually very similar to the military standard type severity. And that's a really great strength of the IEC standards. It defines it gives you a, a better definition for direct lightning, that 10 by 350, an indirect lightning strike, something that's identified by 8 by 20, which essentially means a, a, a short rise time and a shorter decay time. The 10 by 350 persists longer. It will have more lightning energy, more charge buildup. And then we have definitions for things like electrical switching surges, tripping of fuses, surges from installation of power information cables where it's, they're just adjacency and there's surges. So it, it gives us some definitions and many applications will require a, a UL third party type master label inspection to identify that the, the data center has been designed to meet lightning protection standards and is equipped and in operation. And so you'll see NFPA 780, is of course a industry standard that's accepted by UL for the master label. It's been driving standard since the early part of 1900s. We also see the IEC 62305 standard as identified as a equivalent master label type environment for approval from third parties. So I'd like to start with a quick polling question on uh, in our in our process, I've got a couple of these lined up. I, uh, I'm counting on Lisa to have launched them in the in the polls window and please participate. Um, why are you joining us? I mean, it's just a few, you know, maybe maybe you are bored and, you know, lightning is a cool topic and you want to you know hear more about it. Um, always interested in that. We also have another uh, polling question related. To what constitutes the biggest loss to data center? from fire. So what what uh, is it? The lost revenue from the cloud services, public image from a big fire and you look bad in the news, environmental pollution. Uh, this also is a, a uh, 
strong driver in government re regulations and uh, b battery centers that are, that burn up. There's, of course, horrible uh, pollution consequences to this. Uh, customer loss of data, that's practically, uh, you, you can never put a high enough value on that. Um, loss of jobs, I mean, these are th these are real factors. I'm interested in what uh, the, the industry thinks of the values of these, what's the biggest uh, loss? You know, what, what do you feel that's uh, associated with this type of, of uh, fire from natural causes, lightning? And here's a question just to sort of get a feel for the, 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 the applications that you're familiar with now. What functional area of a data center should be protected? Is it the main incoming feed? Is it directly after the backup generator transfer switch, so you're as close as possible to your loads? Is it at fire control systems, chiller plant systems? These are all critical functions at a at a data center. Is it at is it only at the isolated grounds for server racks? What what are the areas that like that that must be protected? Uh, just curious what the the audience also thinks about this as we move forward in our presentation. So this is a really interesting study we did with using lightning simulation uh, tools, uh, PSPICE and XGS Labs, where you can build different models of a structure. We built a, a very basic, uh, we'll call it a uh, server type area. And the, the question was, how much lightning gets into that core region from a lightning strike at the top of the structure? If if everything is bonded and you have multiple paths of lightning, where does the lightning go? And under under these types of conditions, we are able to build wire mesh models, basic assumptions, not trying to make it overly complicated, but come up with some some baseline understanding of how lightning will want to behave. And when we inject the lightning strikes into this type of system, basic model indeed, but you see very clear behavior. Now, I want to say it's clear because it may be difficult to see on the slide because of the, the colors notwithstanding, but I think I can describe it where where you have a in a bonded system, we'll call it a parallel network where you have lightning that can travel in all the possible paths relative to its impedance and what where the the lightning sees the best path. And what you get is a, a distributed sort of net mesh, and that's the point that's the point of a bonded system everybody shares in an isolated system where perhaps i can push the lightning to the outside with mast and keep it out of the structure you get a markedly different behavior where it's on the perimeter and that's what you might see here in green where it's actually all routed to the outside and you don't get very much in the middle in the what we'll call the inside where that network or the electrical system is so what, what what we see happening is based on that model if, if there's something like a chiller on the roof of your data center and lightning is injected into the bonded system you get lightning everywhere distributed and it causes stress and it looks like something like 5000 amps and if you isolate the lightning to the outside you get much less stress on the inside seems intuitive but that's really the point is to is to model and show what that level of stress is reduced by and it's a here it's a from 5000 amps to, to less than 1000 that's the calculations so here's a a question and it, it, i don't want to pose these types of questions in a in a trick way because they're you know i it, in fact in these questions every every uh, answer is actually a good interpretation of the same point. It's it is the theoretical attachment point. The rolling sphere is a distance the step leader can jump just before a, 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 the final a, a lightning attachment. It's the the rolling sphere is the coverage calculation over a structure. It's the theoretical electric sphere, the electric field influence over a structure. So. In, in our polling questions, just want to make sure that people are aware and, and can participate in that poll. Here's another question about uh, lightning. If LPS is not required. LPS attracts lightning to my building. Uh, lightning uh, 
does not attract or repel from a building. It travels tens of miles through the atmosphere and the final attachment is based on the, the behavior of dielectric breakdown in the atmosphere. It's nothing you can do about it to repel it, um, I'd like to say. It's too expensive. I don't, I don't, uh, I can't afford it for my application. I have already a surge protector on my AC power. I don't need lightning. I have a surge protector. LPS is not in the spec. Okay, well, that's a, a big driver economically, of course, and LPS, in fact, is required for my building. I'm just, again, polling question. I want to understand what people's impression of this market space is. Uh, I have another polling question. How does lightning induce surges? And in this case, it's, again, trick question because they're all methods. For instance, lightning is direct coupled, directly injected. It isn't electromagnetic induced phenomena. It is ground potential rise provoking the voltage from line to ground to have high, a high ground potential rise at your building actually provokes that voltage. It's all three of these types of methods in some proportion for your facility. And there's things you can do about some of these things and in, in, in the way of isolating and with electrical surge protection. So this is what it begins to look like on a structure data center type applications. <laughs> this is something that might look like a, a series of masts on a roof. They're bonded or isolated. It's different methods can be used and it builds a, essentially a rolling sphere coverage over the entire roof structure to provide a preferred attachment point for lightning that would otherwise strike randomly across that surface. And if you get up high enough, you can get well into the electrical sphere of influence before it would have struck, that same sphere would have struck somewhere else. You've lifted the sphere up and that's what that, that blue coverage looks like. You've lifted it over the building by putting the tips up higher. That's what it essentially creates. And this is what it looks like on taller structures where you have a, a mesh of attachment points. Uh, NFPA 780 looks a lot like this, uh, where you might have smaller tips at more frequent distances. Uh, but essentially, you have a very similar approach where we have a series of, of air terminals applied over the structure. And this creates that rolling sphere estimate where if you roll that ball of a given dimension over the structures, you will now see that you've lifted the canopy above the structure, much like a circus tent. It's, it gives you that impression, but that's what the electric field calculation is. So what happens if we don't apply all five aspects of lightning protection and you get flash over from the down conductor into your structure because it can't be bonded or wasn't bonded correctly. And here we see flashover from the down conductor into the electrical wiring. And the the level of, of uh, fire risk that you have from that sort of flashover type event. <clears throat> here we have a down conductor that's adjacent to a lighting fixture and some outdoor other sensors and things that might be security cameras. It looks tempting to be adjacent, but if that area, if that building is struck by lightning, you'll have easily have high enough currents that will flash into the adjacent metal structures and in, of concern, things like lighting control systems. So I have a interactive polling question for earthing. This is a sort of rule of thumb. How far apart should earth rods be placed? Uh, the depth of the rod equals the space apart. That's a rule of thumb. Uh, are there some set requirements that your standards have for perhaps in your structures, you may have uh, demand for 20 feet or maybe just the bare minimum that, and it, that the National Electric Code Article 250 would require. It might be only a 10 foot rod. Just Curious what it looks like in your in your own experience. These are some of the grounding methods that can be applied on a structure. You can have what's called type A, which are individual down conductor 
rods meeting into the soil. It can be a it can be a horizontal rod with a certain amount of uh, conductor in contact with the soil based on the level of risk. It can be a buried earth rod, or it can be a type. B, which is a ring around the system, uh, often called the, the grid ring, but it's essentially a conductor that surrounds the either within the the uh, foundation itself or around the foundation. With that, that's a, a a ring around the structure. We see both kinds; they're both permissible under the IEC and NFPA standards. They look very similar in in in, in nature. But the point is, the type A is it is an individual and the type B is a collected ring around the base. Both work when properly installed. The master ground bar, I'd like to also point this out. This is a, uh, the, a, a type of feature that I apply and you can, no matter what your block diagram looks like, you can always think of it as there's always a single master ground bar that everything attaches to that has a single output to the earth electrode. So there always is some kind of picture, like no matter what your cabinet looks like or your data center looks like, it will always have something that looks like a master ground bar for, for an area, perhaps even as small as it. So rack of equipment has its own master ground bar. Each piece of equipment comes to that master ground bar with a dedicated run to it with two whole lugs to prevent uh, loosening and, and rotation and stress, and then a single connection back to the earthing electrode from that master ground bar. This is a very common theme. Here's a question for the audience from uh, operators in, the, in this market space. What, how often are you counting grounding and bonding issues that you've been able to identify that looks like a grounding type issue? A couple of times a year, even as many as more than 10 times per year. I'm curious for the, the polling questions and looking for that feedback, and we can share that polling result. <laughs> Soil resistivity, grounding, bonding, this, this is all a huge, in, you know, very important aspect of proper lightning protection. What we find is that the Article 250 requirement for grounding is not necessarily sufficient for an actual lightning protection system under NFPA 780 or IEC methodology. The, the application of air terminals requires more grounding conductors in this buried into the ground for the attachment of the down conductor system. And what we find, this is a huge in, important issue. We, we address it scientifically. You can take soil conductivity readings. You can go back to your IEC risk analysis, and you can determine the risk of your building may be higher than, a, than what's the bare minimum. If your risk of of lightning damage at your facility requires you to have a higher threshold of uh, of tolerance and, and more concern about the the lightning protection then you can calculate more earthing system so it's, it's a great advantage in the iec methodology that gives you really clear guideline on how to use the standard to calculate your risk and apply appropriate measures from what type of equipment should a down conductor separation be maintained? So you have a down conductor down the side of the building. Should you keep it away from neighboring buildings, trees, conductive parts, roof mounted structures, interior instruction installations, all of the above? It should be a, a down conductor should be separated from everything around it, any metallic object around it. If you cannot separate, then bond it. And that's really the nature of bonding distance calculation and the separation distance calculation. They're very similar within IEC and NFPA 780 with some differences, but the point is you, you calculate how close your metal can be. If you're too close, you have to bond to it. If it's something like an electrical wire in a house, is the nature of controlling the the surge within the the structure so <laughs> these types of calculations can be applied you go to the, your roof and you look at your electrical 
uh, lightning protection system and all the other structures around it. And you can observe where there's objects that are too close, in which case you have to bond to it. And this is very typical of a lightning protection system, a bonded system where you have roof vents, you have chillers. In this case, there's a control box that is too close that should have been bonded. So that's a, a failure. That's why that's a mistake. You look across a typical roof, you're going to have a, a, a very wide range of equipment, chillers and such, that are all going to be part of the lightning protection system. You'll bond to it. It'll look much like this. But then you have that issue of you've now injected lightning into the building. Be careful what you be careful what you ask for. You're now injecting lightning. So air terminal placement should be applied to to avoid side flash. You don't want that flash into the metallic structures around it. Uh, here you see a lot of uh, roof mount structures, chillers and such, different heights, pitches across the roof, uh, cable trays across the roof. And in this application, we're applying isolated lightning protection methods to prevent injection of currents into the into the electrical system and that puts the lightning on the outside of the structure into the soil preventing injection of currents into the electrical system in the first place <laughs> here's a couple of uh, photographs that give us a good inst indication of what that type of environment looks like it's very complicated you have a lot of structures if you can get your air terminal placement up and and avoid injection you can very very much simplify the lightning protection system and keep it separate from your chillers and all of your other electrical and and uh, bonded electrical systems so there's a lot of times where you can't avoid that that issue you have such large metallic structures on the on the roofs of buildings such uh, a large arrays of chillers that may have uh, visual cosmetic barriers around them. All this metal is probably best suited for a bonded system. You're, you can't avoid the metal. You might as well bond with it and have it be part of the lightning protection system. And you know, so there's a lot of different challenges that we understand. It's not a it's not a uh, a cookie cutter as we would as we would like it. So we've got a few slides that really delve into what that electrical bonding and electrical equipotential bonding and earthing system can look like. And depending on the level of, of uh, greenfield engineering, if you're starting from scratch, what can you put in the ground to begin with to make the system far more robust throughout the life of its uh, service so that you have a, a very robust grounding system with embedded down conductors in the columns so that it's always equipotential bonded it's on the outside structure but you've you've used the structural system to to dissipate uh, and bond the system for for reduced lightning effects so these are very common uh, methodology that we see employed both above grade, below grade, embedded in concrete, lots of different uh, options available using the right materials. So data center protection, here's some, some examples of some uh, work that is a electrically bonded system on the top of a metal roof. And so you have a network of mass that produce that rolling sphere solution so that you've protected the structure, but you've created a, a grid essentially and a network of down conductors down the side of the building and a network of grounding connections into the soil here we see that the the site has been measured and you can actually use that very low impedance in this case less than 0 0.03 of an ohm where that low impedance connection shows that it's a well bonded system so that's what we're looking for is these loop readings that tell you that it's a very highly interconnected electrically bonded system. This is an example of what that might look like on this at the at the roof of the structure with your augmented reality to see what that rolling sphere would look like. If you had your electric calculation eyes, you would see that the electric field will strike the air terminals and the step leader will strike the air terminals 
well before the same electric field influence would have struck onto the structure. And then you've controlled that strike and brought it safely into the into an equipotential bonded system. Here we see a similar application where we're using isolated lightning materials and high voltage isolated lightning materials to keep the, the, the lightning strike on the outside of the structure to avoid bringing it in the first place. And so those types of rolling sphere calculations look very similar. You have the air terminals on the building. You have that air that that coverage above the system. You've provided a zone of protection underneath the structure. But along with that zone of protection, you need earthing and electrical surge protection throughout the network. Sorry for the spelling mistake. The electrical network, the entire building has to be evaluated. So all of the service entrance, anytime you have things like step down transformers, transformer switches, uh, motor generator options, you want to have backup uh, systems, but you also need surge protection embedded throughout the facility because of the nature of, of the, the threat environment. And the rule of thumb is anything more than 30 feet, some, some people use 100 feet, but basically when you're looking at a large scale data center operation, you're going to have a distributed network of electrical uh, load centers driving these individual types of servers and rack equipment with an extensive electrical bonding and electrical surge protection uh, network requirement. Um, very similar in a larger structure. As you, here you see the, the surge protection suggestions at various load center panels at key network areas at the front entrance, service entrance, after the motor generators, after transfer switches, where surges are being both generated and where they're being, where the victim also resides, so that you have a what looks like a distributed system, a coordinated system. You attack it at at key levels, and you can reduce the threat through levels of surge protection and a coordinated system. You know, before and after transfer switches, surge protection. Polling question. Uh, again, it's it's a trick question, so I'll walk through the answers, but it, it, it does in fact provide equipotential bonding from the electrical wires to the local ground. It controls the voltage between wires to ground. It is a surge current path to ground. Surge protection provides a transportation of electrical circuits, transparent operation of electrical circuits with a voltage relief only during the transient event. So it doesn't do anything until it really is called for, and then it does its job on a daily basis. Provides no value if it's not installed. Well, I'm the surge protection guy, so of course I prefer some answers. Uh, really interested in what the the uh, the what your value statement is from the from the attendees. So please participate in the polling questions. So that zone of protection. This is a a quick look at at what that looks like. You've got levels of protection throughout the structure, and the closer you get to your core function, the, the more protection you want to install. Conveniently, my products are labeled red and yellow, and it's easy to see how they're applied between the electrical lines and the, and the best uh, master ground bar type application where your surge is being diverted into the grounding system tends to look like this where you have the red devices on the AC power and the yellow devices on distributed data collection uh, related to the operation of a data center. Here's very typical applications where you want to have your surge protection to uh, really applied at all of these types of critical systems. Um, Depending on the, the nature of the fire alarm system, these are mandatory de, uh, application of, of surge protection systems. So we find that uh, these fall under both National Electric Code and systems where you have a highly exposed uh, 
motor or motor control system, you might have a, lot, a more demand for a combined system of surge protection with, with data and AC power in similar applications. Uh, we know that SPDs are required directly at the fire control system, uh, control panels, things like your, your electric and uh, safety and exit warning signs and fire control systems. Data collection, very important in a data center, in fact, because you mod constantly monitoring the, the security and safety of the environment of the data center itself. So you'll have any number of sensors throughout the system. Some of them are even so far remote, perhaps at gate entry or doorway entry systems that they're on a separate ground. So here's a sketch that really in itself is a, a conversation that can go for 10 minutes with a, a design control systems. But basically, which end of the twisted pair should be bonded? At the field instrument, at the cabinet, the PLC, is it is it actually section A, selection A? Is it both ends should be bonded? So this type of question helps me understand uh, the level of, of uh, problems you might have seen in the past. And so in this application, think of this like a, a key card entry at a data center. You're coming through your main gate. You've got uh, some level of power over Ethernet or some cabling that's the twisted pair or four to 20 milliamp loop circuits, the SCADA circuits that are gathering data out at that gate entry. And there's a shield that should be attached to the local ground through a surge protection device. So this is just one example of the, the types of challenges in grounding and bonding where it's a, a remote structure. You can't be on the same ground, but if you are able to apply surge protection, you can still help control the, the, the equipotential bonding and apply proper grounding and bonding and control of voltage driven spikes. So we talked a bit about light ice of the lightning protection systems and the 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 function of that is to essentially divert all of the lightning energy away from the victim some applications like rockets launching from launch pad to complex 40 down at cape canaveral maybe where spacex or where nasa does their launches from you see it's a a perimeter of air terminals towers very tall mass with catenary lines and the the guy wires calculated it at, at an angle that'll actually reduce the the electromagnetic pulse effects as well so there's there's a lot that can be done with the science of 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 standard ben franklin principles and so the electromagnetic wave behavior of this type of of structure and how it can be designed to fundamentally reduce the stress on the launch uh, vehicle. So there's a lot going on in a structure like this. Isolated lightning protection prevents side flash from a down conductor into adjacent structures. It prevents ground potential rise into the master ground bar from nearby earth rods. And it prevents ignition sources caused by sparks between unbonded metal surfaces. So it's removing the threat entirely from the victim. And in preventing much of these size, uh, types of problems, these are even uh, ignition sources. So what we discussed today, top level, the, the data center protection issues showed a, a little bit of the science, explained how that really influences the, the distribution of lightning air terminals around a structure. And that helps us really design the air terminal down conductor earthing it helps us calculate separation and the bonding of SPDs and electrical systems around a structure. So that's the summary of what we covered today. Uh, I'd like to please uh, have uh, the attendees visit, visit us on social media, uh, visit dane.com for more information. Here's a quick reminder of the, the certificate numbers that we can uh, apply for you. If, if you need a certificate, please let us know. Uh, I'd like to ask Lisa to please discontinue the recording session. Uh,
of our event today. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for that.